ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today we will be discussing a case of a young adult who presented to us with an accidental injection of methanol. Can we begin, sir? So, this patient presented to us with an alleged history of accidental ingestion of turpentine. The thing is, he ingested it on 16th, but he presented to us. Is it possible to, to take accidentally to take methanol? The patient may give so many different histories. Mm. Is it possible? So accidentally, the thing somebody is, can develop. Uh, accidentally, somebody can take methanol. It's a clear fluid, sir, and it will be present in a. Smell will be there. Smell. So, so unless day. until you you are uh, like you are on influence of alcohol, it is not possible to take methanol as a water, clear water. If you are under the influence of alcohol, he then he it. can take. Otherwise, it is. We will never miss methanol. What is the age, ma? He is uh, 52 years, sir. He was working in a place, came and came back, was thirsty, found the water, he just drank. He took about a gulp is what he's saying. This happened on 16th of April. He presented to us a week later, eight days later. Uh, so, he presented with us. Uh, to us with vision loss. Okay. So, in our initial 10 second assessment, patient was conscious oriented. Uh, in our primary survey, patient's airway was patent, no secretion seen. Uh, uh, then, uh, breathing wise, patient had air entry bilaterally equal, respiratory what rate was. breathing uh, abnormality you expect in this type of patients? Uh, patients can have tachypnea, Kusmal's breathing can be seen, sir. You too? Uh, acidosis in the uh, blood. Almost so, all types of Alcohols, they develop acidosis. Acidosis, Kusmal's breathing will be seen. So, this patient had normal respiration, not tachypneic, not, dis, not in distress, with a respiratory rate of 18 cycles per minute, maintaining a saturation of 98% in room. Oh, and one week elapsed. Yeah, already one week had been passed, sir, and he had already been evaluated and extensively managed from outside. Okay. He presented to us with vision loss complaints, okay. predominantly, along with dysphagia. And then uh, moving on to a circulation part, circulation wise he had a heart rate of uh, 74 beats per minute, maintaining uh, blood pressure of 130 over 70 and all peripheral pulses were palpable. What are the heart rate abnormalities you can see in alcohol, alcoholic intoxicated patients? Uh, patient can Or first. methanol, poisoning or alcohol intoxication. Alcohol causes, uh, if at all, long term alcohol yeah, intoxication to be dilated ER, no? cardiomyopathy. Absolutely, they come to ER with intoxication of alcohol, methanol poisoning, ethanol poisoning. What is the heart rate, BP abnormalities you commonly see? Uh, BP, there will be hypotension, sir. For yeah, tachycardia, will be there. Tachycardia will be there and dilated. Tachycardia will be there. Tachycardia will be there. Autonomic dysfunction. Alcohol, all types of alcohol produces autonomic dysfunction. So, they can have tachycardia. Mostly tachycardia and hypertension. Some rarely patient develops bradycardia. and But normally what you are seeing in your patient is autonomic dysfunction, tachycardia, hypertension. This patient had all peripheral pulses being palpable. No profuse sweating or anything was seen in this patient. And then disability wise, he had a full GCS score of 15 over 15 and pupils were reactive, uh, bilaterally reactive pupils. What type of shock alcoholic patients can have? What is the type of shock they present with? Distributive. Distrib yeah. Type of shock. If patient has infection, septic shock. Alcohol, alcohol. Alcohol, acidosis. With warm peripheries and tachycardia. Mm -hmm. It's a high output shock. Mm -hmm. high, output high output shock. It is not actually shock, high output state. Mm -hmm. Then they slowly develop shock. Mm -hmm. Why they develop high output condition? Again, autonomy. It is due to thiamine deficiency. Ah, okay. Okay. Beri beri. Beri beri. It is beri beri. They are present with beri beri. Mm. It is actually a high output state mm. and slowly they develop, they develop shock. Actual shock. Okay. So, you should be very careful. Alcohol patients come with uh, tachycardia, hypertension. You have to see peripheries are warm or they may develop sometime uh, to shock, and shock later. later. Okay. So, initially patient may be absolutely normal. Mm. Suddenly they deteriorate. And uh, exposure wise, he was not running any temperature and GRBS was normal about 1 or 2 milligram per deciliter. But GRBS has to be kept in mind because patient can go into hypoglycemia okay. state quite frequently. Okay. Why they develop initially most of the alcoholic patients you can see the sugars are very high. Suddenly they go to 
hypoglycemia why it is like that that is because the uh, glucose neogenesis is liver is a main organ for gluconeogenesis chronic so alcoholism. chronic alcoholism liver will get affected and patient will have hypoglycemia their blood sugars are very high but suddenly they and they have features of hypoglycemia at the same time mm. sugars are very high why it is like that is the glycogen stores are these sugars are not storable okay yeah they do some activity and this sugar will be released okay they will not be stored to your whatever store you have that is a difference between a high sugar in a patient who is who developed sugar after taking some food food this one or alcohol alcohol sugars are only increase the sugar but it is not storable okay so these patients have chronic liver disease can have chronic liver disease suddenly sugars can go high and after sometimes you can see patient is developing hypoglycemia because these sugars are not stored and liver is also not producing sugar suddenly they develop hypoglycemia so you should be very careful in here yeah. so uh, then this was our primary survey in our adjuncts we did a vbg in order to rule out any acid base derangement okay. and this patient was found to have metabolic so alkalosis vbg both are same for ph uh high mild differences at points are very mild difference mm-hmm. so to know the uh, ph vbg is no only oxygenation and uh, co2 Ventilation level co2 part, uh, be uh, very careful otherwise mm-hmm. vbg is alone is enough mm-hmm. so this patient was found of metabolic alkalosis with a ph of 7.46 and a pco2 58.5 and bicarbonate was 40.1 uh so why you think uh, bicarbonate is relevant from treated from outside okay. hospital so mostly so it is uh, it's a treatment related treatment, uh, uh, alkalosis because otherwise acidosis methanol causes high anion gap met, uh, acidosis. metabolic acidosis okay. uh so uh, along with this lactate levels were checked and it was 1.1 because this ingestion was about a week later we did not really have typical features of methanol toxicity as okay. such and then uh, ecg was done to rule out any qtc prolongation okay. any so arrhythmication in which type of alcohol mostly ethyl ethylene glycol not in methanol it's common in ethylene glycol toxic toxicity so sinus it was a sinus rhythm and no sct changes or qtc prolongation was not noted and then this was a primary adjuncts moving on to the secondary survey he was not known to have any comorbidities in the past not on any medications not even known to have any drug allergies now according to the history that he gave in it was an allergy history of accidental ingestion of turpentine which contains methanol and 100% uh ethanol uh about a week before his presentation following which he uh, uh he he had profuse sweating but then eventually he uh, over a span of about a day he gradually lost his vision and then he had sweating is due to what again autonomic profuse sweating is due to autonomic, autonomic dysfunction so especially about diaphragm that mm-hmm. is in the thoracic uh, segment distribution area if the patient is having sweating that is a sign of autonomic dysfunction classically seen alcohol ingestion and called intoxication all this so along any with this which sorry sir we have consumed uh, any amount only one uh, exact no uh, exact one, quantity uh, in mls was not notified sir it is more important uh. to say the quantity co ingestion of anything in empty stomach or in full stomach uh. according to the history that he gave in it this okay. happened at the workplace so he hmm. was working outside uh in under hot sun came in thirsty found water kept like clear water kept he assuming it was water he took a mouthful the minute he took in he realized it was not water and then he did not really take in any more so in ml it was not quantified but it was one mouthful gulp okay. of the the liquid that he took in it's a mixture of uh, both ethanol and methanol yeah uh, it was a mixture of both ethanol and methanol so follow uh, it was fasting since the morning it was fasting that mm-hmm. day morning So following this the immediate symptoms were chest discomfort burning sensation in the epigastric region along with this he had sweating issues and then a uh, vision loss uh, he developed through the course of the days like gra- it was a gradual thing it wasn't an acute onset of vision loss and then he was taken to a nearby hospital wherein uh, but there was no uh, um, any decontamination and all was not done but there is no role of decontamination in, in ethanol and methanol toxicity because it's rapidly absorbed and therein a uh, um, patient was conser- conservatively managed in view of dysphagia ogd scopy was done at an outside local hospital which showed so zagar relation between the ingestion of um, this uh, darbendin and uh, going to the first hospital 
फर्स्ट हॉस्पिटल वॉज विद इन कपल ऑफ आर्स एग्जैक्ट टाइम डू यू नो विद इन कपल ऑफ विजन लॉस वॉज थ्रू दैट नाइट टू द नेक्स्ट मॉर्निंग इट वॉज लेट ऑन सेट इट वॉज इन फर्स्ट हॉस्पिटल सर when he was hospitalized is when he developed vision loss issues mm-hmm. it was not prior to the admission so uh, role of activated charcoal in uh, methanol poison there isn't any role so it's rapidly absorbed so there is no major role for gastric decontamination, decontamination or uh, activated charcoal at least in methanol poison uh, so uh, there ogd scopy which was done and it showed grade 2 esophageal corrosive injury was noted in the esophagus so there Uh, post ogd scopy rt was also placed under uh, guidance and then patient was given rt feeds ever since now because his uh, symptoms vision loss became more profound is when he came to us for further management of it so uh, uh, this was the history sir then uh, in our clinical examination general examination patient was not noted to have any sweating or palpitations no complaints as such he gave in and uh, systemic examination was pretty much within normal limits air entry was bilaterally equal adequate chest excursions were seen yes, no cosmos uh, breathing vision first we will ask for whether he is able to perceive light whether he is able to get the hand movements and then we stand at a feet and ask him to read out uh, any letters that he can see so with that we'll get an assessment okay what he got what was his vision uh, so in the left eye he could only perceive light there was no not even hand movements just light he could perceive in the right eye he could uh, there was blurring but it was still better than the left eye to be more precise sir, the left uh, right eye visual equity was 1 by 60 okay. so type of visual disturbance initially he will get is there any specific type of visual disturbance blurring will be snowfall snowfall visually it will be snowfall what is the problem here in the vision vision what is the problem so vision basically uh, uh, in methanol toxicity methanol basically uh, gets metabolized uh um uh, by alcohol dehydrogenase and then by aldehyde region uh, dehydrogenase and ultimately formate will be producer so formate and formic acid they cause retinal injury majorly because of mitochondrial dysfunction following which patient will end up with optic disc hyperemia will be seen and then there will be quadrants will become thickened uh then um hyperemia then what else can you see This is more like optic neuritis, like just with this. It's like optic, optic neuritis. So uh-huh. neuro- neurologic, ne- neurogenic visual loss. Yeah. How do you differentiate that peripheral visual loss from central visual loss that you commonly see in stroke, posterior circulation stroke? Posterior circulation stroke, you will have that ho- uh, homogeneous, not that homogeneous. One clinical test. Macular. Central visual loss or peripheral visual loss? What is that? It's a very simple. test pen uh, bilateral central be bilateral central can be unilateral or bilateral <laughs> but uh, most state is bilateral but how do you differentiate macular what happened to light bilateral. reflex because you have peripheral visual loss mm-hmm. in a patient when you test the light reflex what will happen Pupillary reaction. That means pupillary. That will reaction. be normal. Pupillary reaction will be normal in peripheral. Central, it will be oculomotor. It goes in, and then pup. So that pup- will give you the difference. Okay, mm-hmm. so you have to read about that. This is the only difference which can make out by a ER physician whether it is central visual loss is there or peripheral visual loss. When you put the light, if your peripheral nerves are not normal, suppose they are abnormal, what will happen to the opposite side? The reaction will not be there. Mm-hmm. Understood. Oh. Yeah. It is central loss, okay. central visual loss. The opposite side and same side will react. Mm. Okay. Mm. So that difference you have to know. Whenever you are examining eyes, okay, whatever may be the visual loss. This is here. It is clear cut. We know that it is in the nerves. It's mm. a neuropathy. So we know that it's a, it's a peripheral nerve disease. Mm. But sometimes you will not be knowing. Mm. The same patient can have. central stroke also mm-hmm. okay so you have to always examine and 
document the pupillary reflexes light reflexes okay. so the uh, light, light reflex pathway never go to the posterior part uh, posterior part of the brain okay its mm-hmm. pathway is different that's right linger was one okay we are not discussing that but mm-hmm. that test has to be done and it has to be documented okay. so uh, the patient was diagnosed to have optic uh, toxic neuritis okay. and uh, then uh, then other than that systemic examination is normal now lab investigations echo are also you want to do echo want to do baseline echo or the person wrote any cld related like chronic kidney right? disease no you want to see whether it is dilated you will be mostly alcoholic patient yes let look for any dilated cardiomyopathy right. dilated there cardiomyopathy okay. so there are two types of cardiopathy cardiomyopathy is described in alcohol what are the two types one is l cardiomyopathy one is l cardiomyopathy other one is ri ri l is commonly seen because of the toxicity of alcohol ri is due to the thiamine deficiency mm-hmm. so both Output. are described so we yeah. do an echo and rule out so yes. both are different thiamine induced cardiomyopathy is mm-hmm. right ventricular dilatation with peripheral artery dilatation alcohol induced cardiomyopathy is always mm-hmm. lv dilatation not lv lv and r rv sorry in this patient specifically you have to not only this patient 52 year old man seeing me whether any history of uh, alcoholism the patient is a chronic alcoholic and any comorbidities especially with reference to metabolic and cardiovascular issues or respiratory issues you mm-hmm. should also be always be related the history you did not tell properly no, in this history there is no known comorbidities no, you should not tell it okay. so it should be going in an order all right okay, sir good. Okay. then uh, this was his baseline uh, visual acuity and then investigations were pretty much with the normal limits all the blood parameters were with the normal limits so and because this patient had a uh, ingestion period about a week ago we did not really send in for serum osmolarity otherwise the priority so has to be when we send serum osmolarity what in basic investigation from er will force you to send serum osmolarity uh, hypo basically serum osmolarity whenever there is whenever ethanol whenever there is a uh, toxicity uh, there is an acidosis acidosis high anion gap acidosis only you have to send for serum osmolality yeah. yeah. there is no acidosis no need to send the osmolality because yeah. if the acidosis is there if it is high anion gap metabolic acidosis then only you are checking osmolar gap to understand osmolar gap osmolar gap yeah. okay otherwise we are not no going point. to do what is osmolar gap osmolar gap gap is nothing but the difference between the calculated and the serum osmolarity okay. level so now how do we calculate serum osmolarity is in two ways when, when whether if we do if we take the units as milligram per deciliter it will uh, we'll have to multiply sodium levels into 2 uh, plus the glucose levels divided by uh, 18 plus bun ratio divided by 2.8 okay. this is if the units are in milligram per deciliter okay. but if at all we are doing it in millimole per liter we have all it is milligram per deciliter uh, which okay. is why we will have to divide the glucose by 18 okay. and urea to uh, bun ratio by uh, 2.8 to get the value okay. uh, but if it, if at all the units are in millimoles per liter then it is 2 into sodium and we have one more difficulty we don't we don't uh, uh, have bun we have urea urea uh. so that dif- calculation is also there, there. Uh. so it will be very difficult for us to calculate this formula uh. okay but if it all be taking millimoles per liter then it is 2 into sodium plus glucose plus urea so uh, this with this calculated serum whatever value we get we we uh, uh, find the difference from the serum osmolarity and if at all the osmolar gap is more than 10 it is significant significant so we see we do it in ethanol toxicities methanol toxicity um ethylene glycol toxicity so in this thing the calculated will be uh, lesser than the serum osmolarity the gap will be more than 10 okay. so uh, but in this case we hadn't sent for uh, we because no acidosis because there is no acidosis mm-hmm. there is no need to send such uh, costly investigation or cal- difficult calculation that because sure. uh, we don't have acidosis mm-hmm. suppose this patient comes in first stage itself mm-hmm. then we would have uh, done all this uh, investigations oh. okay but even then all these things are very difficult for a normal doctor so what the routine practice what you how do you uh, how do you go in this patient you see as you high anion gap acidosis mm-hmm. that patient is having visual loss mm-hmm. that is a commonest problem 
patient is immediately patient will lose his vision mm. so you might have seen patient who come with vision loss after taking mm. this type of uh, alcohol next day exactly. such they come with uh, or mm. after few hours it still they develop vision loss mm. so vision loss associated with high anion gap acidosis will give directly the clue of uh, methanol toxicity mm. one thing is sometimes a group of patients will be coming yes, yes, illicit liquor okay. So, in this patient, when ophthal consultation was placed in view of vision loss, and they initiated the patient on steroids and erythropoietin. Yeah. Uh, erythropoietin is an off-label use, wherein we give a high dose okay, of erythropoietin. Okay, that's the ophthalmology consultation giving all these drugs are uh. add-on drugs. What is the primary drug you start Sir, for uh, methanol poison? Uh, methanol toxicity, there are two ways to go about it. If the patient can afford and if at all... Uh, it is available then fomipizol has to be given 15 mg per kg iv loading dose we give followed by 10 mg per kg we give on a bd dose if the patient is improving then we continue it otherwise we hike up 10 mg per kg dose to 15 mg per kg bd dose this is fomipizol but let's just say fomipizol is not available then ethanol itself can be used at a uh, um, dose of 10 ml per kg we use for 10% of ethanol has to be given as a loading dose then 1 ml per kg infusion has to be initiated no. so uh, this is how ethanol and fomipizol are the antidotes for methanol toxicity no. uh, then uh, uh, then uh, other than this uh, if at all well, acidosis is going for dialysis mm. so, so the dosage will be there any variations or you will maintain the same dosage for same Probably I don't get you the sir the ethanol if the oh. patient is undergoing dialysis in your hospital and you want to give formipasol methanol is the, the already the patient is taking the treatment oh. in the meantime they decide for a dialysis so dialysis patient should have an indication for dialysis so yeah. like the yeah. osmolar yeah. gap is going for dialysis both are simultaneously going on mm -hmm. but is there any dose adjustment I don't know sir. not aware increase the dose Both the things are dialysable. you can dialyze it, mm -hmm. so we need to double the dosage. Okay, okay. Sir. Okay. and we instead of BD, we have to go for the fourth hourly for people. Fourth hourly. This and occurs. This, this can occur because be patient who who have chronic renal disease, mm. they many times they come with alcohol intoxication, methanol poisoning in same patient. Mm. So we sometimes uh, instead of going for dialysis at the late stage, we have to. Go, initial dialysis first stage itself mm. the patient mm. is already having crf and if they take methanol poisoning directly you have to take for dialysis, dialysis. and we have to give formipasol also mm. Mm. so uh, if it if acidosis is there mm. and uh, in order to remove the toxic metabolites sodium bicarbonate also can be given so okay. that is given in the dosage of 1 to 2 milli equivalents per liter and then uh, about 132 has to be Uh, given so basically 200 ml per hour infusion has to be initiated what is the action of uh, sodium bicarbonate on uh, formic acid it will help in excretion renal excretion it will help and also correct the acidosis okay. so acidosis this is, is due to formic acid formic acid formic, formic acid, formic acid. acid. Acidosis can come down ah. so apart from these two the next main stay of treatment like so mentioned it will be hemodialysis Hemodial. and it will remove The, But uh, the in normal settings, like, like normal primary care, second care, care uh, hospital, you don't have uh, all these things. Dialysis is not there, formipasol is not there, erythropoietin is there. There, what you do? We give it the normal. You normal no, alcohol. No, no, no. That is the treatment available. So instead of alcohol. giving high, all these high end treatment, you can simply give alcohol, which patient also may prefer. So better to give alcohol so that they will improve. Uh, so folinic or oral. Oral. We have. We can do. We can give oral. both. Okay. Oral. Oral. We can give. Thank you. Oral dosage. Two to three ounces. Two to three ounces. Uh, baseline. Then you have three ounces. Two to three ounces. One ounce is equal to how many ml? Thirty ml. Thirty. Thirty ml. Thirty ml. Share. Um, then uh, folic acid also has a role to play, sir. In folic acid we give 50 mg IV. We give every Q6 hourly, or folinic acid also can be given. Folic acid is ideal because it's an active, active. form. Folic acid at a test of or then convert to folinic acid. So directly we have to give folinic, folinic acid. acid. And other vitamin also has got role because in uh, ethylene glycol toxicity also can occur. 
pyridoxine pyridoxine uh, all these things has to be all multivitamins has to be vitamin given thiamine uh, pyridoxine and folinic acid, acid. Yes. all things better to give all things because it will be a mixer of all toxins mm. so the so what is the renal status for this patient when you are examining do you expect or anticipate it? any complication due renal to renal dysfunction so mm-hmm. renal dysfunction it is majorly caused in ethylene glycol poisoning mm-hmm. and it will cause an uh, anuria oligouria will be there but it is reversible anuria and oligouria mm-hmm. so if dialysis dialysis and all is done then renal function will improve but unlike methanol toxicity wherein formaldehyde gets uh, broken down to or metabolized to formic acid there the retinal injury can be permanent vision loss can be there but uh, re- uh, renal set is reversible so regarding the uh, ethylene glycol poison uh, what will be the renal function how it will be affected um, um oxalates u- urine o- oxalates it will form uh, mm. glycol will be produced then urine analysis oxalate crystals will be seen yeah. so that is how it will damage the renal Preci- uh, tubules it will damage so uh, this is the renal function ethylene glycol it is majorly renal toxicity methanol it will cause majorly the retinal injury uh, optic toxic neuritis will be seen this in that this patient had any creatinine this patient had uh, labs were pretty much normal so and then uh, through the course of his stay in our hospital uh, vision improved from left eye only light perception he was it improved to 4 by 60 and right eye up and a uh, recent visit review it it had improved to 6 by 6 also so what was the initial treatment any discharge summary depicted from the other hospital how they managed uh in the outside hospital uh, um, ethanol was given sir and uh, he was planned for dialysis but because there was no derangement in the rfts and acidosis was not seen it hd was sos basis he was treated ogd scopy was done to check for the corrosive injury and he was put on a gastro medicine consultation for further for rt feeds and for reviewing of uh, esophageal corrosive injuries other than that nothing no other issues were done so you are giving ethanol what precaution uh, you have to take ethanol sir mm. ethanol basically uh, it is a cns inebriated uh, it causes an inebriation and cns depressant uh, it will be so uh, frequent blood sugar level sh- hypoglycemia mm. and patient can go in hypoglycemia mm. part diabetes also you say arrival actually if our ed has supports an advanced point of care machine like an ebg with a cox metric you may be able to like enter the initial methemoglobin in that initially also methemoglobin uh, methemoglobin so can be associated so that if we, we our ebg machine has got mm. so if it's coming about 25 in our initial ebg uh, levels actually we can give consider giving met- methylene blue also methylene on mg per kilogram can be given over a period of 5 minutes So the initial level, if it is above uh, 30, the patient may have show signs of like auto sensory, might some distress and all that. But above 50 percent, the patient can even go into features like tissue hypoxia, arrhythmias and all that. Okay. So initially, uh, if our point of view machine supports that, we can go for that even also. So it is better to see uh, methemoglobin Methem- also. Methemoglobin. We have our ABG machine has got that, that. Uh, it supports, but mm-hmm. some machine may not be there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. that's about it sir. so how was the patient after uh, at the time of discharge uh, his major complaint that precipitated was his vision loss but after about a week of reviewing the patient's vision has improved especially the left eye which he could only perceive light had this an improvement to 4 by 60 and oct uh, was done is a newer line of treatment uh, in uh, uh, methanol, methanol 20000 so international papers on that mm-hmm. it shows some improvement mm-hmm. early uh, Erythro, but the dose is different, and it is IV. IV, twenty thousand international units. We give IV for about three days, okay. OD daily. Okay. So uh, then OCT was done. OCT showed in the right eye there was superior inferior. OCT means um, that optical coherence tomography. Okay. So that was done, and inferior and superior quadrants there was thinning, and whereas in the left side all the quadrants were thickened. Okay. So comparing to all of this, there has been significant improvement in his visual acuity. Anything else you want? Anything? Methanol, formis, bisol. Okay, thank you. Thanks.